<laughs> well, I'll try my best to make this entertaining. There's a lot of just like scientific stuff that I'd love to describe and talk about. It explains why we're going to do what we're doing and why we should eat the way we eat. But sometimes it gets really boring just reading like research papers and the explanations behind them and, and what the study says. Mm -hmm. So I'll try my best to summarize, explain what it kind of means to me in clinical practice and how it can affect normal everyday people. And then, more importantly, we'll throw someone on the table, I'll poke and prod, and I'll show you why it affects them based on physical exam findings as well. Because that's always fun for a lot of people to see how it, how it affects them. So today's topic was... The sum is greater than the whole of its parts. The sum is greater than the whole of its parts, that's right. <laughs> so when we think about food, we often just think of things that we eat. We don't stress about what it actually is made of, or what it comes from, or how it matters, or why it matters. There's a guy that started... Uh, the company called Standard Process, it's a nutritional company. His name was Royal Lee. And he would used to go around asking people, and he, you gotta think, this back in like 1929 or so, and he had these wind up watches, and he'd hold up a watch in front of everybody and say, which part of this watch tells the time? That's a question I'd pose to you guys. Which part of the watch tells the time? The whole one. The whole thing. The whole thing. If you take the springs out by themselves and the gears and do it, if you have it all just laying out on the table, not one part is the time telling part. When you put it all together in a specific way, and you wind it up, now it can perform the function that it's looking for. Food is not so different. For example, if I asked you, which part of this is the egg? The yolk. <laughs> there are different answers. When it comes to vitamins and supplements and minerals and foods that we eat, the whole is always going to be greater from an effect standpoint than the individual parts or portions of it. So with that in mind, food basically breaks down into parts so that we can become nourished and perform the way we want to. That's why we eat. We can't eat for pleasure. You know, we can go out and you know, do drinks or do desserts or something like that just for the taste of it, to enjoy it. But ultimately food has a sole purpose of trying to nourish our bodies so we can perform the functions we need to, so we go out and do the things we want to. Whether it's think clear, have babies, not have back pain, whatever it might be. So, if we take food and we break it down to its smaller parts, we start getting little portions of vitamins and minerals and fats and amino acids and things like that. I'm gonna pass some of these things out to you guys so you can all have, have copies. So if you look at vitamin A, for example, I'm gonna just take one and pass it on to the rest of the people. We know vitamin A is a portion of, it's a vitamin. It's found in a lot of different um, foods, most of the ones that have orange pigments and things like that to them. And vitamin A has a lot of specific roles within the body. It's antimicrobial. So you'll see here on number two, the bullet point there says, vitamin A cuts children's malaria risk in nearly a third. So this guy went down to malaria infested places. He threw a bunch of vitamin A in their life and then they remeasured their blood levels and their malaria titers had diminished by nearly a third just by using the vitamin. So the number one point there where it says virtues of vitamin A discuss. It talks about infant mortality in, in compromised places. And so this one guy took 200 bucks, went and bought a bunch of vitamin A, went down to somewhere, wherever he went to, from somewhere in Nepal. Nepal. And he gave all these kids vitamin A just to see what would happen to their mortality rates. And their mortality rates improved. So they were healthier because they had more food in their life. So when we look at just the effects of something as simple as vitamin A, we can see it cuts malaria. It also has a chance to increase infant mortality rates. I'm sorry, decrease infant mortality rates, increase in the lifespan of a child. And that's a cool thing. Well, that's what happens when you have food that's not being able to get into someone's life. They've come malnourished. Their body now is more compromised. They now have more issues. Well, the interesting thing about that is if you take synthetic vitamin A, down at the bottom, number three there, you'll see that synthetic, synthetic vitamin A has a little bit different of an, an effect. It says supplements in doses of 10,000 international units per day while pregnant, even within the first three, three weeks, increase birth defects by 240%. You know why that is? It's fake vitamin A. You will never get 10,000 international units of vitamin A in anything in real life. So when you take something, even though it looked good as part of the whole, but you isolate it out and feed it to somebody in a particular way, the body will react. Sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. Vitamin A at high doses has a bad way of reacting inside pregnant people. Interestingly enough, if you get 20,000 IUs of vitamin A per day, it's a 400% increase in birth effects. Hydrocephalus or water on the brain, cleft palate, 
mental retardation, things like that. Just by something like a vitamin that we consider to be safe and very easily available. The interesting thing here from this study is down at the bottom it says, the mutagenic effect of vitamin A supplementation from man-made forms can occur within the initial three weeks of conception or before the mother even knows she's pregnant. Which is very powerful for me from a standpoint because I give people vitamins and supplements and things like that. And I tell people to eat a certain way. So I'm always constantly in my mind thinking, shoot, could this person get pregnant? And if I give them something that's synthetic, is it going to potentially affect the baby or something else like that? But yeah, we can walk into CVS and buy 2,000, 10,000 IU vitamin A tablets and not even think about it. So the sum of the whole is definitely going to be more potent and more effective if we use the whole thing together rather than isolating these individual parts and putting it out. And it's not just vitamin A that I'm picking on. Um, the interesting thing here in this one, it says that, second, uh, paragraph, I mean, the last paragraph in the end, the researchers were careful to note that carotene, beta carotene, and preformed vitamin A in the, in the amounts and form in actual foods did not result in birth defects. Carrying 48,000 carrots in a day, it can take the whole, it can break the flush out what it doesn't need. When we isolate things and start taking them in higher bigger predicaments. We all eat food that has synthetic stuff. So these isolated components, when they get into our diet, start playing a factor and playing a role. But it's not just vitamin A, like I said, there's some other ones. So here's vitamin E, for example. I'm gonna pass that around if you'd like. Investigators here found that women whose vitamin E source was dietarily displayed. I'm sorry. So people who took vitamin E displayed significant reductions in LDL oxidation. However, when people took vitamin E via supplements, it increased their oxidation levels. The more they took in, they're worse, their LDL oxidation. So what is vitamin E found in? Where do we get those types of things? Eggs. 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 You pointed to the eggs, right? So fatty type things, so the eggs, what else? This is what we learned. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Nuts and seeds, <laughs> eggs. We can get vitamin E in, in places like that. Wheat actually has vitamin E in it, wheat germ is high in vitamin E, it's very high in it. Um, so if people can tolerate wheat, that could be a good source for them. Interesting note here is, when they ate it from their normal dietary source, there was reductions in LDL oxidation, so it's antioxidant in nature, but when they took it from synthetic forms or in higher doses than what should be normal, there was oxidation that occurred or inflammatory responses. The interesting note here from this says alpha tocopherol, which is what you find in every vitamin E supplement you'll ever eat. Alpha tocopherol displaces the gamma tocopherol in our tissues. And the gamma tocopherol is the more protective portion of it. That's because in vitamin E, when you eat it in like an egg, for example, you have alpha, beta, gamma tocopherols, and different portions do different things. The vitamin, I mean the, the gamma portion of the alpha, of the tocopherol is more protective in nature, it lowers oxidative stress in the body, becomes more beneficial. We get that through real food, just like we talked about before with vitamin A you get vitamin E in real food. Because we don't want to pick on one of the fat soluble vitamins. Vitamin C has a really interesting one here. So this says a study found a six week study of individuals taking 50 microgram supplement of vitamin C. So I misread that. 500 milligrams of vitamin C had a pro-oxidant as well as antioxidant effect. So we think of vitamins as being antioxidants. So Things are inflammatory, we take a vitamin, we take something, we eat a certain way, inflammation should go down, we should feel better, our life should be happier, our husbands are more compliant, our girlfriends look prettier, you know, all this stuff happens when we start getting healthier. So when this happens, and vitamin C comes in and now tells us that we're getting pro-oxidant, so inflammatory creating problems, and antioxidant, and inflammatory reducing problems, we see that vitamin C may not be as cracked up as we think it is because not only did it oxidize things, it starts damaging the genetic portion of our DNA. So 500 milligrams, which is common in almost any multivitamin you ever get that has C added into it, has about 500 to 1,000 almost always added into it. When these people took it for 
six weeks, it started denaturing their DNA and messing up reproduction of their cellular metabolism. But on the other hand, it was being semi-protective to parts of their DNA as well. So they're just looking at this and saying it's doing both. Some parts take the DNA, take the vitamin, take the food in its synthetic form and they do okay with it. Other parts, they start getting altered and they start messing up with it. In contrast, like it notes here, vitamin C naturally present in food has no oxidizing effects. Now the reason that's interesting is because this is basically what vitamin C looks like under a microscope. You have the vitamin C shell, which is the ascorbic acid. You have the copper enzyme, the tyrosinase. You've got some bioflavonoids. You've got some other P, J, and K factors. The guy that found vitamin C, his name was Sven Georgi. In the early 1920s, he won the Nobel Prize for discovering ascorbic acid. And it's called ascorbic acid because it's anti-scurvy in nature. So scurvy is a vitamin C deficiency where you bleed and you hemorrhage out. So people that brush their teeth and they bleed when their teeth brush, are brushed or they floss and they bleed have subclinical scurvy a lot of times. People that have osteoporosis, it's a subclinical scurvy of the bones. People that have hemorrhoids or varicose veins, those can be subclinical scurvy presentations. We don't live in a scurvy rich environment because we get synthetic forms that can kind of trick our body to think in a certain way. But a lot of us will present with scurvy-like conditions, bruising easily, things like that. So Sven Dorby was going around and he discovered this molecule and he said, I found it. This is the thing that when I give it to people, their scurvy goes away. They stop bleeding, their teeth don't rot out anymore, they stop hemorrhaging, they stop having all these issues. So he started isolating it and trying to mass produce it. In the mass production process, he only got the shell out and all the rest went away. And he started giving people ascorbic acid, synthetic isolated ascorbic acid. And afterward, after already receiving the Nobel Prize and everything, he said, guess what guys, we missed the boat because now what I'm doing isn't working anymore. We had to go back and reevaluate what's happening. So he was giving people isolated ascorbic acid. He called up the Nobel people and he said, guess what, I messed up. We need to retract this because we didn't quite find everything that we wanted to. And they said, sorry, Sven, you already got it. We're not retracting our statement. So two years after winning the Nobel Peace Prize, or not the Nobel Prize for whatever year won, he uh, wrote a book, and in his book he talks about how he didn't have the whole thing correct. Because he was isolating things rather than letting the whole do its part. He found that when he took um, ground up red peppers and gave that to people that had scorbotic problems, then their scurvy would go away. But when he only gave them these isolated ascorbic acid, their symptoms wouldn't change and wouldn't go away. Once again, reiterating the, reiterating the fact back from the early 1920s that the sum of the whole is greater than its individual parts. Now, is ascorbic acid always going to kill and denature DNA? According to this study, yes, because it's going to do the, uh, the aniline, aniline portion rather than the, the G1, whatever that one is, in the DNA. But when it comes to actually getting what people need health wise, the whole is going to be better. So, eating foods that are rich in the vitamin C complex are going to be the better part. Kind of like if I ask somebody here to make the scrambled eggs with just this stack, it wouldn't be able to happen. This is the protective barrier in the shell that protects all the good stuff that we like. Ascorbic acid works very similarly. It protects the oxidizing portion of the good stuff that actually feeds and nourishes the body that stops the scorbotic process not too different in nature. Kind of like when you take an apple and you cut it open. At the very beginning, it's nice and white. You leave it out for a while, it starts to what? Yeah. Turning yellow and brown or oxidizing because it had certain vitamins and nutrients inside of it to protect it in nature so that if it fell from the tree and had a chance to go germinate and grow a new apple, apple tree or whatever, whatnot, it would be protected in the meantime. It would have ascorbic acid as a shell. It would have other vitamins and nutrients that are antioxidant in nature to protect the good reproductive stuff in the middle. Nature's plentiful in examples like this between whether it's apples or fruits that have berries around them or eggs like we have seen this, or even on a microscopic level where we see ascorbic acid being a protective shell to protect the good yolk and the good stuff in the middle. Let me a picture. Another one is an enzyme or a mineral called chromium. Chromium picolinate, or chromium picolinate, depending on where you read and how you pronounce things in English, um, has also DNA altering effects in the body. And so an interesting note here is supplements that contain chromium picolinate with vitamin C, as in the form of ascorbic acid, are the most potentially dangerous in mutating our DNA, which is neat. 
because like every supplement in the world that deals with blood sugar balance has chromium pickle in it. And it's an isolated synthetic form that's never even found in nature. So they take chromium, they mix it with some other stuff, and chromium pickle in it shows up. But yet it has denaturing effects on our DNA. The chromium-2 enzyme interacts with oxygen to produce hydroxyl radicals known to induce mutations and cause other types of DNA damage. But just like we saw before, we would isolate something like vitamin C, ascorbic acid, and now we isolate something that doesn't even exist in nature, put them together, give them to people, your body looks at it and goes, whoa, this is stressful. This isn't what I'm designed to eat because I'm used to eating apples or oranges or eggs or whatever in their whole form, not in their isolated components. So when we look at the body, one of the absolute, hands down, no questions asked, best things we can do to try and get to where we want to be health-wise is to stop eating things that contain ingredients. If it has a label, it probably shouldn't be consumed. <laughs> because when we walk out in real life and we pluck an apple off the tree, it's good to go in that state. When we walk out and we kill a deer and we shoot it and we eat it and grill it up, it's good to eat in that state. I always ask my patients to look at their supplement labels when they come in. And I give them this pamphlet to take home and browse on their own. Yeah, and it basically comes down to if you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. So I'm not saying supplements are evil. You guys walk out of my shelves here, I got 8,000 supplements for different things and different reasons. But they have, I use supplements with purpose that are all food based things in nature. And I'm not saying mine are better than other people's or anything. I'm just saying from a conceptual standpoint of how we should address things in real life, food based approaches are always the best. So I always open up this pamphlet to the very first one here where it says supplements A versus supplements B, or brand A versus brand B. Mm -hmm. Now I ask patients to read brand B as fast as they can. Try that really quick out loud, as fast as you can. Read every one of those. It looks like you're reading chemistry, which is right. not good. And I always tell them, I say, if your fifth grader couldn't read it, it's probably something synthesized by two guys in a lab. Not that they're being mean or evil or bad, it's just they're probably trying to do things a little bit differently. Now, if you go up to the top and try reading brand A as fast as you can, you're probably more likely to read those words and your fifth grader could probably do it too. There may be some words that are a little bit weird like anisotol or magnesium citrate or whatnot, but as a whole, those look like whole foods, those look like food-based items that are more likely going to work in your body than other things. Now, does that mean if you go up to a supplement label and you read it and it, you turn it over and it says kale and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, that it's probably good? The better chance that if you turn it over, it says deoxyglucoferol, ascorbic acid, and a bunch of other things. Doesn't mean it's best or normal that you need it. It just means it's probably something that's going to work better for you due to the nature of the things that are inside of it. And the reason that is is because when God put together foods, or the caveman's evolved, or whatever, into foods, then we started having these ingredient labels within these foods without having to uh, to need them on the side of a pill. So regardless of what this supplement actually is, it shows a great example of what we're seeing right here. So it, this supplement uses food base. It's got like peas and carrots and oats and liver and stuff like that inside of it. And if you open it up, you'll see carrot alone has a whole bunch of chemical properties to it. So if you ate a carrot, you had over 200 nutrients that wouldn't fit on a bottle from A to zinc on the label. Because carrots have real food. The sum of the whole is a whole lot better than its individual parts. So rather than taking DL alpha tocopherol, why not eat the carrot that has DL alpha tocopherol as well as everything else inside of it so that we get the full nutrient value that we're looking for. And it's like that with all foods. When we eat something, we're getting a whole lot more nourishment and a whole lot more bang for our buck when it's in its whole, for, whole food form rather than we start isolating things out. Because there's a couple of you, I'm going to grab a different packet really quick. This is a blog post I wrote a long time ago and put it into a newsletter that I would hand out to my patients. It's how to understand and read food labels. And basically it talks about exactly what we're talking about now. If the food label has a whole bunch of chemical makeup and craziness, it's probably not something we want to consume because it's made of a whole bunch of individual isolated parts that don't sync well together. When it's a food label that says, I've got buckwheat, I've got liver, I've got oats, I've got fluff, you know, whatever, in its whole food form base, it's probably something you'd want to eat with. And it works across the board. So for example, this here, 
see if you guys can identify what this is. You can all look over Elaine's uh, shoulder and see what that says. By right, looking at that, tell me if you think you can identify the product. It's chocolate It's one bar, so it's like a Snickers bar. It is a bar. It's not quite a Snickers bar. Oh, it's one of those health food bars. Yeah, it's pretty. It is a health food bar. <laughs> it's a health food bar. So it's that's an Atkins bar. Oh, nice. So, so when you go to an Atkins bar, you know, you think Atkins, maybe whole food, Atkins, eating meat, eating fat, eating proteins all the time or whatever. But yet when you look at the ingredients, it's a whole lot of just chemicals and stuff that they threw together in a bar and said, mm -hmm. this is healthy for people that are trying to go low carb and trying to eat, you know. It's not even like it's low carb at all. It's, it's not, <laughs> at all. it's not even low carb. But it's just one of those things where it's a bunch of synthetic stuff. It could very well pass as a Snickers bar. You know, if, if we look at food bars, like if we look at Snickers and we say, man, this is just chocolate garbage and snack. Well, people are touting that as food, but it's not, it's not food. It's a bunch of small chemical components that are mixed up and thrawn together. And uh, it's a Snickers bar with sugar alcohols instead of sugar. Right. It's so here's like another one. Protein and I don't mean to dog any of these companies or anything like that. But sometimes we look at things like this and we read it and it says, oh, there's no gluten in it. It's all natural. It's all awesome. But similarly, when we start looking at ingredients, you want to pass that around. Things start looking a little bit differently. Because on the food ingredients label, it's still processed, packaged. Food substitute looking stuff. Like, that's her name. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and I'm not going to dog that, that lady or that company or anything like that. They're just putting together certain things, touting them as food, when our best option is really to go to the source, to eat the real thing. Even though it may say gluten free or all natural or whatever it might be inside of that. If we just eat real, unadulterated, non processed things, we have the opportunity to start having our body thrive and flourish off of eating those again. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so like, the gentleman basically, you know, go for whole food, right? Yes, ma'am. But in this like, example, okay. it's like saying carrot root A complex, you know, nutritional yeast to B complex. Like, it sounds like they're taking a part of them, or, or are, they, are they saying that what they're, they're saying? trying to add this ingredient to get that complex? Right, so what they're saying is that particular company, they mm -hmm. grow all of their own food for their mm -hmm. supplements. So if they want to make that product, which is Catalan, it takes about 276 days from seed to supplement on the bottle. So they stick it to the ground, they grow it on their organic farms in Wisconsin, <coughs> they pull it out, they take the carrots, they mush them down, and they're like, this is going to be our vitamin A complex food base because carrots have a lot of vitamin A in there and they throw that into their supplement. Right. Then they get their beets, then they get their nutritional yeast, and they get all their stuff and they mix them all together and Try and do it off of a food base rather than just synthetic stuff and, and throwing it out there. Okay. Um, but yes, it's predominantly a food base. Now that's not 100% food base. They will still throw so, some synthetic stuff inside there because for two reasons. Under the table, non-recorded right now. Hmm. First one is the FDA requires that things with a suit, with a nutritional supplement have labels and have synthetic stuff inside of there. So if they sell a B complex, they can't sell a B complex unless it says B vitamin something added to the label. Mm. So it'll have nutritional yeast, it'll have whatever food base they want, and then they'll throw in like 25 milligrams of B, and they'll say, this is our B complex. Just mm. so that they can meet FDA labeling requirements. It's lame. It is lame, and they don't like it at all. They would love to have a product that has 100% whole food based and keep it that way. So you're saying that basically like all the vitamins at the supermarket are synthetic? Well, not all, but like not all, of them, but it's a good way to start looking at it. I went to Walgreens before coming over here, and it hurt to buy some of the stuff I bought today for our demonstration purposes. But when you read the ingredients label here, for example, I know. I will. <laughs> <laughs> so read that ingredients label out loud for us and tell us what you think. Okay, sorbic acid and cellulose gel, hydroxyl propyl cellulose, plus carbonylose sodium. Steric acid, magnesium, stearate, silicone, or silicon dioxide. Yeah, that's it. So, based off of what we've gone over so far, does that sound food based or non food based? No, that's not food based. Non food based, right? So, this is basically <laughs> vitamin C from a company that sells vitamin C. If it said on the label, like, 
camu. Camu is a, is a fruit and it's got a whole lot of vitamin C inside of it. Or if it said sago, sagos are palm leaves that have just lots of vitamin C inside their fruits and stuff. Or if it said buckwheat, buckwheat's huge concentration of vitamin C and, and you can get the bang for your buck that you wanted by eating a real food instead. Mm. More importantly, go out and eat the buckwheat or the sago or the camu yourself. Don't get it from a pill if you don't have to because then you're getting the real nourishment that you would need anyways. Um, so once again, Dr. Roy Lee, the guy I referenced before that started Standard Process, uh, he tells a story about uh, this lady that lived out on the farm and she, her son is huge with fever and, and feeling just terrible. And they call up the doctor. The doctor comes out to the farm from town, his little medical bag in hand and everything, and uh, fills the son and says, yeah, he's probably not gonna make it through the night. Y'all should probably just kind of Take it easy. I'll go stay at you know the neighbor's place. I'll come back in the morning and take care of all of your affairs. Don't worry about it. And the mother's just like devastated. She's like, no, with all your medicine, you have to be able to try and do something. And the doctor says, sorry, dude, it's not working. Probably is the exact quote. Um, so she's like, you know, it's just not working for here. And she's like, well, fine. So she sells, sends all the boys to all the neighbors and asks for as many lemons as they can get. And they all come back with as many lemons as they can. And she starts cutting up the lemons and just dripping lemon juice into his mouth all night. And she says something they just learned in the old country, and then that's what they were going to do. And the doctor comes back the next morning, and much to his dismay, the child is sitting up in bed, and the fever's gone, and he's just sho shoveling down food as quick as he can. And the doctor says, man, what, what happened? He's like, well, all it is, we just started dripping lemon juice into his body all night. And that's, that's basically what we did. He said, well, you know, I've kind of heard of that. And she says, heard of that? You know, I mean... You just told me my son was going to die and there's nothing you could do, but yet now you're saying you've heard of that? And she's like, well, it's not something professional, so therefore it's not something I can recommend, so I didn't think about it. But the answer was, go back to food in this situation, the vitamin C and the nutrients of the lemons was enough to take this child and get him to be a healthier person at that time. And, and so with, given the opportunity, we should always look for food as being our base for what we're trying to, trying to accomplish. And if we use food to be our, you know, our medicine, then, then we get a much better bang for our buck in that opportunity. Now, that's not to say you can't isolate things. Ascorbic acid, you know, you, there's a guy named Lonnie Spallin. He used to take like 12 milligrams, no, 12 grams of ascorbic acid a day. You know, this study that we passed out papers on, that says 500 milligrams a day for six weeks denatured DNA. And Linus Pauling comes out and says, dude, I'm taking 12 grams of this stuff, you know, a lot more than what this study comes out of. And the researchers comment on it. They said, you know, eh, we don't think that's legit. Not everybody should do it. That was their comment, more or less. So, I mean, some people can tolerate things a little bit better than others, but according to the DNA denaturing, it's probably not the best way to go based on what that particular study was coming out and saying. Um, yeah. So what I like to do with people though is you never know. Some people can tolerate things and some people need synthetic type of things. Um, as a doctor in practice, when I see people, sometimes I just give them herbs and sometimes I give them synthetic stuff and sometimes I give them a little bit of both. But the best way for me to help determine is through poking and prodding. You want to see what it looks like? Yeah. You want to go to my example sure. today? All right, let me put up some of my mess here. <laughs> Yeah. Even though it's very hard to buy all this junk that I'm about to use, I'm going to open it up anyway, just for demonstration purposes. Well, it might be, might be kind of dirty. <laughs> There's no judging here. Okay. Um, anything I should know about going on with you? No. Nothing. No, all right, no, later no. back. I went to the dentist today. You went to the gym, you said? The dentist. Oh, the dentist. He said I had good teeth. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we kind of talked a little bit last time when we came in that poking and prodding on the body can sometimes give us some good insight. I like to do a basic exam with most patients. And, well, with real patients in the office, I do a much more than a basic exam, but like in demonstration purposes, I like to poke and prod some and just kind of see what shows up and what it means to me, if anything. If we can find something great, if we can't, we'll get a different uh, guinea pig to poke and prod on I have a messed up knee. Oh, yeah? <laughs> we might play with you in just a second. Find a jab on your ribs like this. Any pain or discomfort? None. A jab on your ribs like this. No problems. A jab under your ribs here. Any problem? And then under here. Yes, slightly here. A little bit here. A jab on your face like this. Any pain or discomfort? 
It was good, but no pandering is hungry. Yeah. Alright, good. So let's try this out. So a lot of the low back muscles, when they're weak or create pain or have problems, can be associated with the vitamin E imbalance. A lot of the immune-related muscles in the body can be associated with like vitamin C imbalance. So we'll just check some of those and see if any of them show up. If they do, we'll try some stuff out. If they don't, we'll get somebody else and see what happens. So take your leg and push toward the outside. That's a good strong muscle. Doesn't seem to mess you up. Push out. That seems like a good strong muscle. Push up and out to the outside. That seems to work. Push up and out to the outside. Good. Grab on the table with both hands. You're going to take your legs and push your legs toward the crowd of people there. Right? And that seems to work okay. Keeping your hands on the table, now push your legs toward the whiteboard. Alright, so all those seem to work pretty well. We'll try one more. Hold right there. And gently press up to the sky. Good. Those all seem to work okay. We're going to put something off and see if any of those low back muscles change. Okay. Mystery stuff. There's a lot of mystery this time. The last time it was at the hiding because it was poison. <laughs> We're just going to experiment with your mouth. Bite that. No, no, just bite that to where you can taste it. It'll probably taste gross, but you'll do it right. Can you taste it? No, I can't. All right. Taste awesome? Not terrible. <laughs> okay. By tasting that, we create a neurologic reflex. Your tongue now tells your brain what's going on. Your brain's now telling the rest of you what's going on. If it was shellfish and you were allergic to shellfish right now, you'd be dying. If you were peanuts and you were allergic to peanuts, you'd be dying. Well, if we stuck something else in your mouth, we're going to see if your body changes since you're not dying on the ship. That poking prod here, any change? No change there. That poking prod here, any change? No. Did this get any better? No. Did it get worse? A little bit. A little bit worse? I came this side? That's worse. That's worse? If I jab on your face like this, any pain or discomfort? Nope. Still feels good? Yeah. You're really wet now. You can ask her to do that later. <laughs> <laughs> Congrats again. Thanks. Push to the outside. Little back muscles. Push out for me. Those feel as strong as they were before? Yeah, a little bit weaker. Push up and out. That one seems okay. Push up and out. That one seems okay. Mm -hmm. Grab on the table with both hands. Push toward the outside. That doesn't seem quite as well as it did before. Push toward the outside. That doesn't seem as well as before. Mm -hmm. Hold that right there. And don't let me push down. And that seems okay. Mm. So, whatever that is, doesn't make you as good as you were before you put it in your mouth. Because before, there was less pain on, under your ribs, and muscles worked better inside of you, specifically in your low back. Now, in the grand scheme of things, what does that matter? Are you taking synthetic vitamin E supplementation? Nope. nope, don't do it then, because it messes you up. <laughs> but, depending on what his symptoms are, we would potentially recommend something like vitamin A. For him, it made him a worse person, even though symptomatically he didn't really have any issues going on. Pain became worse when we jabbed on his liver and gallbladder area, which potentially makes sense, because vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin. It's going to require more fats to be broken down through his liver and gallbladder. So jabbing here, becoming more sensitive, makes a little bit of sense. Vitamin E is often associated with low back stuff. The muscles that specifically went weak are his glute medius muscles and his quadratus lumborum. Low back stabilizers. I mean, if we put something in his body that his body doesn't like, it sees it, recognizes it, and says, hmm, probably not good for me, and then it tells us. Let's figure it out. Very tall. Yeah, very tall everything. <laughs> so let's see if uh, let's see if you're still weak or not. Yeah. Hold on the table and push that one. Hold on one second for me. We have to fix you. Uh oh. The antidote in. You have a real bad uh, gluten problem? No. No? This one has gluten in it. Like that? Suck on that for me. We'll see if we change anything by you doing that. Taste okay? I think it tastes worse. Tastes worse? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the gluten you taste. <laughs> if I do this, same better or worse? Mm, just as bad. Just as bad? I do this thing? 
Maybe even worse. <laughs> worse? Grab one on the table with both hands. Push your legs toward the people. Still weak. Push your legs toward the whiteboard. Still weak. <laughs> yeah, that was really weak. <laughs> Push up and out. That's still strong. Push up and out. Good. Push to the outside. Still weak. Mm -hmm. Push to the outside. Still weak. Guess what? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have that garbage in your mouth either. <laughs> Sit up and uh, there's a trash can right inside my room. What is that? that yeah, you already dissolved. You already dissolved it. <laughs> <laughs> Always and officially. Yeah. Now, from a standpoint of just evaluating him, though, something like both of those things we just gave him are terrible for him. He had no symptoms to begin with. We stuck something in his mouth, and he got a lot worse because of it. So don't do that. Synthetic vitamin E was the first one. Uh, whole food-based vitamin E containing foods were the next one. But those also had gluten in. So it's not the most perfect test for you, but basically that was bovine orchid extract, calcium lactate, Spanish moss, bovine spleen, bovine spleen, and isotol, bovine adrenal cytosol so extract, so oat flour, and ascorbic acid. It didn't taste good. Do you know what orchid extract is? No. You don't want to. <laughs> I grab my water. <laughs> so it just has a bunch of stuff that's common and high. Yeah, it's, oh, it's testicles. So. Mm. Well, I, I, should, <laughs> I should go lift some weights or something now. Right. Right? <laughs> no, but it's something that has a lot of vitamin E inside of it. And so it's something that company puts together and says, this is high in vitamin E. Let's see if someone needs vitamin E, they might benefit from it. Well, he didn't, obviously. It's not something he would want to be taking. And both of those, even the synthetic and the whole food based forms in their concentrated parts, made things worse. You wouldn't want that. <coughs> Would taking a fat soluble vitamin I mean, that play a role here? Or? What was the question? What do you mean? Well, if, if he has a negative reaction to vitamin E, being a fat soluble vitamin, right. would, would him not eating any fat with it have any effect on it? I don't know. Possibly. There's a lot of stuff that plays a role there. That's why we never ever want to diagnose one thing off of one test. Mm -hmm. But we'd always look at the sum of the whole mm -hmm. instead of its individual parts. Because that one test tells us absolutely nothing other than you probably shouldn't do that. Right. Synthetic stuff at least, and probably not the whole food version of that either, mm -hmm. because of how his body tested. But he didn't really have symptoms to begin with. He needs to keep eating how he has been, because it's obviously working for him, and, and just go from there. Because symptomatically, we didn't have a starting point other than just some basic muscles we were experimenting with, because I asked him to be getting big. There are portions of, it's a dry fat inside of there though, so you'll still get some type of the gustatory or the tongue tasting response. It stimulates the bile and stimulates the liver to try and say, hey, there's stuff coming. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a dry fat rather than a liquid fat like the first one we did. Mm -hmm. But it's just fun to poke the prod on people and see how they respond and then see if it gets better or if it gets worse. Mm -hmm. You want to try it with your knee? Let's see what yeah. can show up, if anything. Yeah, she's going to get my knee adjusted. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. How do you lay your head this way? <laughs> Head over here. She does this thing. On your back. Just that would taste much better. On your back. Oh. <laughs> <be> like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Which knee? This one. Alright. Do you wake up at night to go to the restroom? Yeah. Between the hours of 1 and 3 in the morning? Usually? No, it's early. No, it's earlier. Earlier. It's like more like 5 or 6. Okay. Do you ever get headaches? Mm -hmm. Not really. Do you ever get neck stiffness or instability? Not really. But knee pain, yes. It's not painful. It's just it's it's messed up or it has like this bump on the back. Okay. It's it's, it's not painful though. Right. Let's see if we can find out. Those are my symptoms. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. <laughs> a lot of people that have knee problems, knee just like instability, will also wake up and have to go to the restroom. They'll have headaches behind their eyes, over their ears, where the base of the skull, kind of like where their sunglasses go. Mm -hmm. They'll get neck pain, neck instability, knee pain, knee instability, mm -hmm. hemorrhoids, varicose veins, and. Uh, they're walking gallbladder problems. So when the young ladies walk in the door and say, hey, my knee hurts for no reason at all, mm. I think immediately let's try to move out liver or gallbladder stuff. But we'll see what happens. I'll do what I just did with Jason a second ago. If I poke on your ribs like this, does that hurt? Okay. But no pain when I do that? On this side? No? If I dab under your ribs like this? And on this side? No problems? If I dab on your face? Is it painful? No. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst, what would you call it? Two. Two, okay. 
Um, so there's a knee muscle. Hold that right there for me. It's called your popliteus. When she holds her leg like that, don't let me spin your foot. Yeah. That hurts me, do that? No, it's just... Hold it in. It seems pretty strong. Mm -hmm. At least locks into place, even if it may not feel very good. Hold it. Don't let me spin it. Push your leg up and down. Push to the outside. Good. Push to the outside. Push up and out. Good. Bend your knee. And bend this knee. Push up to the sky. Which one? This one. Oh. Okay. Bring your ankle down toward your bottom. Bring your ankle toward your bottom. Turn your foot out like that. Bring your ankle toward your bottom. Right. Hold again. <laughs> Turn your foot into the inside like that. Bring your ankle down toward your bottom. No one does okay. So really the only muscle we find that's weak with you is, is your hamstrings. Hold like that and bring your ankle toward your bottom. And that one just throws you for a loop. Does that hurt when you do that? No, it just doesn't hold. Doesn't hold? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you got that evil one. <laughs> So long, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, I mean, I mean, <laughs> There's a really good chance it's going to taste disgusting. It's the worst tasting supplement I own. Open it what? <laughs> Suck on that for a second. Can I spit it out? Eventually, maybe. Unless it dissolves in your mouth, like it dissolves like me. You taste it? I put it on the back of my mouth. I need you to taste it. So you created a neurologic <laughs> reflex. <laughs> you volunteered. She isolated it. You taste yeah, it now? Of course, yeah. Hold that right there. Bring your ankle down toward your bottom. Try that again. Push really hard. Try that again. Get stronger. But not like I wanted to. <laughs> More supplements. <laughs> or you might get the second worst tasty one. <laughs> you want to spit that up for me? Do you want to know? It's got bile salts in it. If you know what those are. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Lift it back for me. Uh, Open it away. Can you taste that one? I don't know you can taste it. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Pull down to your bottom. That was decent. Push down again. Did that hurt as much? Push down. No problems? Let's spit that out. I know there's no graceful way of doing that, but you did awesome anyway. Just out of curiosity, because it is part of our demonstration today. You hear that? It's 10 bucks going down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> Put that in your mouth for me. That's surprising. So calcium seems to do it for her. It turns this muscle back on. So the first time I used not calcium, something that I thought would actually fix the problem because of her knee issues. It has a lot of bile salts and things like that. Because even though she doesn't have all the gallbladder symptoms we were just talking about, it still is hard for me to not think gallbladder when someone walks in with a knee thing like this. So I gave her something that I would usually give people that have gallbladder stuff. Go ahead and get that. Is that maybe calcium lactate in there? Um, maybe. I put calcium lactate in her mouth, which is a more available form of calcium. But I also put calcium carbonate in her mouth. Calcium carbonate is basically rock or limestone. It's the most common form of calcium you find in supplements. And uh, surprisingly, both of them do it well for you. So I would just say you probably need a lot more calcium in your life. And eat more calcium rich food. And then. Dark green things are always awesome with calcium. I'll eat broccoli a day. Does that count right? You should eat more of that more often. Well, I hadn't been eating it lately. Somebody didn't buy it. <laughs> so <laughs> I haven't been eating it. <laughs> but I normally eat it all the time. There's, and like I said before, like just like we saw with Jason, there's probably more to the picture in both yeah. situations here. But from a standpoint of just trying to isolate a synthetic something versus a whole food based something, 
many times from a physical exam standpoint, we find that whole food based things seem to create a better symptomatic response. So if someone's not in pain and we stick something synthetic in their mouth like we did the first time, it usually causes weaknesses. In this situation, you're a freak of nature. You just don't need that kind of stuff because both of them jack you up. But you don't really have symptoms, so don't worry about it. On the other hand, when we saw knee related stuff, we put whole food based things in your body and that made it better. We put synthetic stuff in your body and that also made it better, which would insinuate to me that, hey man, this is probably a bigger deal. You should probably get this addressed because your body's even craving chemically derived isolated nutrients rather than the whole thing. It's really looking to try to improve from a calcium standpoint. Um, so then the, that's essentially how we can start trying to figure out other parts of what's going on inside of our life. Long and short of this whole story though is we should be eating real food. Real food, hands down, no questions asked. We shouldn't have to get things from packages or bottles. Whether it's synthetic supplements or whole food supplements or whatever, we should be eating real food. If we go back to eating food, we'll have a better symptomatic response because of it. And we can use this extra stuff to prime the pump if necessary. And then if things get really out of hand, we can always use the synthetic or even the pharmacological aspect of things if necessary. But most of the time, 